Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. The last of this uh, marathon workshop is going to be on architectures, and we'll have Joseph Torellas from the University of Illinois presenting the bulk architecture, followed by Kirsten Asanovic, who is going to talk about 21st century architecture research, and Tim Matson on a topic that is a mystery. <laughs> Does everyone want to talk about it? Right. Immediately after that, <laughs> we are going to. Um, move some chairs around to start the panel. And the panel is going to be, can industry and academia collaborations be effective? And we are going to have uh, David Patterson, Burton Smith, hey guys, we're Jim Lattice, started. Can you Tim call Madsen, this guy? Joseph Torellas. And uh, we hope to have a you know, very good discussion and um, to end the, the workshop in, uh, in fire, you know, having real fun. So Joseph. All right, how do I get these guys out of my way? Yeah. Uh, yes. Okay. okay. Uh, welcome to the last session, the architecture session. Um, in this talk, I'll give an overview of the work that we've done in the last four years on the bulk multi core, multi -core architecture. Um, I apologize if some of you guys have heard some of these topics before, but I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on the vision and in the most recent work as well. Okay? So when we started this project about four years ago, we were thinking about what is it that makes a programmable architecture? And that was the goal at the very beginning. Let's make a programmable architecture. And what we've been able to think about is, is a programmable architecture is one that attains high efficiency without a lot of work from the programmer, without the programmer having to do low-level tasks like placing the data or worrying about the coherence. And at the same time, one that in the way it can, it can minimize the chance of parallel programming errors. So we came up with this uh, bulk multi-core, and this is a general purpose multiprocessor architecture, which is cache coherent. And it uses two novel uh, primitives for cache coherence. One is signatures, which are Bloom filters. And the other one uh, is chunks, or blocks, of atomic instructions. And with this, we build the whole cache coherence. And because of that, it relieves the programmer and the runtime from having to manage the shared data. At the same time, because we work on big chunks of instructions, it provides high performance sequential memory consistency. And that provides a software friendly environment for lots of tools, for debuggers, for, for uh, uh, watch points and whatnot. And then we augmented the architecture with a set of hardware primitives for low overhead program development and debugging. So features such as race detection, deterministic replay, address disambiguation are embedded as part of this architecture through special purpose hardware. And this we claim helps reduce the chance of parallel programming errors, and it has an overhead low enough to be on during production runs. So that's the high-level view. Um, I need to just go over a couple more slides to give the, the basic concepts. The bulk multi-core is an example of a blocked execution architecture. It's an architecture where processors continuously execute and commit chunks of instructions at a time. So we are kind of abstracting away single instructions. We, we don't do this anymore. We don't worry about offering the architectural state after every instruction. Instead, processes will execute 1,000, 10,000 instructions, and then commit. Right? And for that, they need to have buffering. They, they buffer the state during this 1,000 instructions, and then they commit. And when they commit, they, it's not that they write back data, streams of data. All they do is they send a signature, and that should be enough to make sure that the state is coherent. So this is the example that we have here. So we have a bunch of blocks, and they commit in this form. You can either have the processor doing the chunking automatically, driven by the hardware itself. This is like, uh, it's not unlike transactional memory, but it's 
implicit transactions. The processor doing this in the background because it likes to do that, right? Or it, you can have the software that itself cuts the, provides hints of where you want to cut the code. And with this, you had higher performance because instructions inside these chunks are reordered by the hardware. And also, the compiler can aggressively optimize the code inside, doing things that would otherwise be illegal. Okay? And just the last slide here on this high level discussion is that a big problem of these architectures is the squashes. Whenever you are executing this work and you find that somebody else has changed the state that you rely on, then you have somebody writing data that you read. Right? You have to squash. And each chunk, then, it's a problem if you squash. And for that, we use a lazy approach. At the end of the chunk, we have to check that there's no conflicts with anybody. We use the signatures for this. OK, so what we do is, suppose you have this processor executing this chunk, this one executing this chunk. No state goes out in the meantime. This one wants to commit. When it commits, all it needs to do is to need to send the signature. It doesn't have to send any data. And the signature is checked against the signature of this other one. And if there's a collision, like in this case, when a processor read something that this one wrote, basically read after write, you squash this one. And chunk commit is quite expensive, so we're going to try to avoid this. So throughout these four years, what we tried to do is to build the whole ecosystem around these chunks. We started with the architecture, the hardware here. Um, we started in uh, communications of the ACM 2009, explains the, uh, the basic architecture. Since then, we have been looking at different aspects of the architecture. We also worked on feeding this architecture with blocked code. Okay? We have a dynamic compiler that is able to take in, get, takes code and is generating these chunks that are used by the hardware. And we're working on a static compiler. And then we can also have a profiling pass that runs the code and figures out what are the communications. And based on that, it gives hints on how to chunk the code. Hmm? So the good thing about, and, and there is also another part of the work, which is this additional hardware that does all the uh, race detection and atomicity violation detection and so on, that uses signature and hashing hardware. So the interesting thing here is that you start with unmodified source code. So you don't start with code that the user has instrumented with transactions. Instead, you start with logs, barriers, flags. You have this compiler. You pass it through here, and then this hardware executes this code efficiently. Okay? So what I would like to focus, uh, and so these ideas have been out, and we've basically told Intel about this uh, several times. So if they are interested, these are the ideas, and, and they can take them, basically. So what I want to focus on is give you some idea on what we've been looking at recently, which is some of these architecture issues in HPCA, and some of the compiler passes here. So this is the recent accomplishments on the architecture side. Uh, one of the papers we published um, a couple of months ago is on allowing simultaneous multi-threaded processors, meaning uh, hyper-threaded processors, to work in this mode of chunks, so all the threads inside an SMT processor working on chunks. We also extended the architecture to support determinism, deterministic execution. And we have um, some work on an architecture to record the program as it's running and deterministically replay it later on. On the compiler side, we had a recent paper last year on how do you, what are the interaction of chunks with synchronization? And what is the best optimal, the optimal place to cut the chunks? And we're working on using alias speculation and other uh, optimizations on pointers uh, using these atomic blocks. Okay, so I'll, I'll give just a, a hint of a couple of things here. So on the architecture side, what we've done is we have used this concept of executing chunks inside an SMT processor, a simultaneous multi-threaded processor. The reason is that many, many processors are simultaneous multi-threaded these days, and you use the hardware better with those. So as you may know, Intel has recently announced that uh, Hashwell has, has uh, support for, for transactions. And it also works, as far as I understand, on an SMT processor. But what we do here is, because you have multiple threads running on the same core, you can tolerate dependent threads. Meaning 
even if you have a collision between two of the chunks that are running on two different threads, we're going to tolerate this and execute and continue executing. Okay, this is the advantage of having this processor with the thread so close that you can keep state nearby. Okay, so that's the main idea here. So we claim that it is the first hyperthreaded design that supports atomic chunks. And we analyze what happens when you have a conflict between the different threads that run on the same SMT processor. You can either squash, you can stall, or you can order and continue. Okay? And also we designed a way of having a many core, a multi-core, where each of them is an SMT processor and all processors run in this mode of chunks. And this is obviously more cost effective than running a single thread per processor. You have higher performance for the same core count and reasonable performance for a quarter of the hardware. Hmm? So here's the, the kind of the, the crux of the problem is that in an SMT processor, all the threads share the first level cache. Okay? And as a result, if I have this processor executing a transaction or a block and writing to the cache, then suppose that another thread reads from this location. Now we have a dependence. Okay? Traditionally, what you would do is you would squash one of them. Okay? Now we want to support, let them continue. And we take advantage of the fact that it is so close, the two threads, that they can keep state. So I can squash, stall, or order. Okay? So this is a pictorial uh, representation of this. So if I suppose I have two threads, this guy is executing this uh, dark block, this is uh, other block. This one reads the cache. We find the dependence through the tags of the cache, right? Or through the, through the, through the load store queue. And then what you observe here is you can either squash this one and restart. It would take this long. Or we can stall the processor after the read, stall. And then when this one commits, since we know when it happens, okay, then we can continue this thread. And that has sped up this pro program from here to here. Or we can actually record that there is a dependence and keep a small table that says this thread now depends on this one. I cannot let this one commit. Instead, I'm going to have this one commit first. And when this one commits, I let this one commit. Okay? So that's the idea. And the significance is that you can run dependent threads in parallel. Hmm? Now, I'm bon I won't bother you with some of the hardware that is needed. These are the different types of mechanisms that we use. You can do it in hardware and software. This is a hardware implementation. And this is uh, what it does. Let me move on quickly to the code generation. So the big picture of how do you generate code for a blocked architecture is very simple. So what you need to do is you need to have some software entity, compiler, profiler, whatever, insert chunk boundaries at strategic points in the code. Okay? And then perform aggressive optimizations in between these two boundaries, knowing that the hardware will guarantee that no matter what, it's going to execute atomically. Okay? And since a chunk may repeatedly fail because somebody keeps messing with you, with your state, you need to create a safe version of the same chunk somewhere so that if you fail n times, then you can go off and execute the plain code with locks and whatnot. Right? That's what we call the safe version. And there are two key ideas, only two ideas. The first one is maximize, maximize your gains. Second, minimize your losses. How do you maximize your gains? You want to form the chunks around the code that you think the compiler can do the most. Okay? So what, is, what are these places? For example, these are pointer intensive areas where you know that the compiler cannot do anything in a safe manner. That's where you want to put the blocks, do a lot of transformations, and then do a check before the, the block finishes and either scrap everything or continue. Or in areas of the code that there are many branches, but you know there is a typically a path that is highly, highly likely. So you optimize for this path and then the exits you squash. Or whenever you have many critical sections that are not contended frequently, rather than having different, them in different blocks, you put them together and you remove the locks, basically. Okay? And then the second is, to minimize the losses, is make sure you cut at points when there is likely communication between the, the threads. So 
We can, we can allow threads to communicate. What we cannot allow is two blocks that are concurrently executing to communicate. That's what we're trying to avoid. So here's an example of the first optimization, trying to group things where the compiler can do little. Okay? So look at this thing. This is a Barnes piece of code where I have a, a while loop, and I have lots of pointers, if statements, and so on. And in each iteration, I have two critical sections that grab the same lock, but the lock is different in each iteration. Okay? But there's lots of kind of this is a very complicated thing. You, you have to dereference a couple of pointers, add offsets, and so on. So lots of instructions here. Though we wonder, can we, if we put this in a block, can we optimize code up out of the loop? Okay? So the first thing we're gonna do is what we're gonna do is we're gonna do lock elision. With lock elision is an optimization that what it does is it replaces the lock and unlock, it removes the lock and unlock, and it puts just a read, a plain read, using while, with, with a plain load of the lock to see if the lock is free. If the lock is not free, it keeps spinning. Otherwise, it continues. Okay? This is called lock elision. Why do I have to have that and not just remove the lock and unlock? If all the threads were executing a block, then I could remove the lock and unlock because they either full, fully succeed or they fail, right? But because I'm gonna have this safe version of the, the code, and sometimes some of them will fail and go and execute the safe version. In the safe version, one of them will grab the lock. So I need to make sure that I don't execute this while somebody has the lock. So I'm gonna check. If somebody has the lock, I'm gonna spin here. When that guy releases the lock, I'm gonna get squashed and restart. Okay, so this is a as a common optimization people do. The bottom line is that by putting, by removing the locks, now we give this to the compiler and the compiler says, whoa, there's no locks here. I can start doing uh, common sub-expression elimination. And the first thing it sees is these, these are different locks at every iteration, so I cannot optimize this thing. However, look at this thing. I, can, I need to generate this multiple times inside the same iteration and across iterations. So let me do loop invariant code motion here. So all the stuff that was in here is computed just once at the top of the loop in the, in a right, and put in a register. And then based on that, I just use the register to access this thing, okay? So notice that I have removed a lot of code. In fact, the dynamic total number of instructions per block moves from 9,000 to 7,700. Okay, and some of them are loads and stores. And what happens if somebody collides with me? Because I have this thing here, if somebody grabs the lock, I'm gonna get squashed and restart. So that's an example of how this thing works. Large chunks are beneficial. So that's one thing. Now, how do, you, do I cut the chunks to minimize squashes? That's the second part of the optimization. We need a profiling pass to figure out what are what we call squash hazards. Okay, so squash hazards is something equivalent to pipeline hazard, but it's, we call it squash hazards because it's something that, given a synchronization access, you don't know if this is a highly contended synchronization. If it's not, it's not squash hazard. Squash hazards are operations that frequently cause squashes. Typically, it's the first communication in a code region with multiple communications. Okay? So typically, highly contended synchronizations, data races, not share data accesses because those are protected by locks. So once you find these things, the sync hazards, or the squash hazards rather, you transform the code tailored with tailored squash removing algorithms. So for certain types of locks, you want a certain type of algorithm that minimizes the, the squashes. Okay, the, the goal is to prevent two concurrently executing chunks from communicating on the fly. And typically it means cutting the chunk before the hazard, okay? So there's a piece of paper that explains this thing. So this is all about the, the base technology for, for chunks. What we are building for several years now, actually, is a hardware prototype for the deterministic record and replay with Intel Labs. And the idea here is to have, to augment the cache hierarchy of a, a simple multi-core with some the memory record and replay engine. 
this or is small, it's not uh, it's small, it's, it is a small thing that what it does is as the programs execute, it basically cuts the execution of the code whenever there's communication between threads and then it stores information of the execution, number of instructions between communications. Okay? And then after a while, it dumps it into, the, into a, a log in memory. Okay? So we collect chunks of instructions, but not speculative chunks. Chunks of instructions between communications, and then we can replay them. So it's a primitive to recreate past states in a computer. It records chunks of instructions until the next communication. And we hope that this will be the basis of a lot of tools, debugging tools, because once you have the communication, the executions between communications, you can do, you can build the tool, say, to detect atomicity violations. Okay, so I want to just, let's ignore this thing. I want to just talk about a couple more projects that, architecture projects that we have at, at UIUC as part of the UPCRC. One is the De Novo. Um, this is uh, my colleague Sarita Adve. What it does is it's hardware for discipline parallelism. So the idea is if I knew that my code followed determinism, you know, the discipline code that DPJ, deterministic parallel Java produces, then I could tailor my hardware to actually be much more efficient, right? So if I know that structured parallel control and explicit effects, then I can simplify the hardware. I can simplify the cache coherence protocol. I don't need to worry about invalidations to the other processes because only one processor can access it at a time. All the transient states are removed. I can optimize the protocol better and easier. And then many of the things that currently uh, cache coherence has, invalidations, acknowledgments, indirection through directory, even false sharing is unnecessary because you know at all times that the data that you want, nobody else wants. Okay? So you cannot have false sharing. And the second project is the Rigel. Rigel is a project that uh, my colleague Sanjay Patel has been working on also for UPCRC. And the idea is to build a thousand core chip for visual computing. So these are very simple cores and they don't have cache coherence. And because the applications are so regular, you're able to optimize the transfer of, of, the, of the data and becomes very efficient. Okay, so that's a summary of our work at, on architecture at UPCRC. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have questions for Joseph? Well, then, thank you very much, Joseph. And let's move to the next speaker is Kirsta Sanovic. He's going to talk about 21st century computer architecture research. Thank you. Okay, is the microphone on? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so because um, I only have 20 minutes, I thought I'd just pick one fun thing to talk about. Um, so this is like a mini rant about architecture research and looking ahead at what we're going to need to do in architecture research. So what's the next big challenge? Well, technology scaling is slowing down and stopping. Everybody knows this. There's no device technology out there that's going to save you. You know, sorry, you know, end of, end of transistor scaling. Um, parallelism is a great idea, but it's a one-time game, right? Basically, the two tricks we played to use parallelism to save energy are either use simpler cores, um, but that's really limited by how small you can make the core. There's only so, you're going to make it so simple. The other one is running at a different operating point, lower VDD, lower frequency, and making it up through parallelism. Okay, but that's limited by VDD, VD, VT, scaling, and just errors you get as you load the VDD. So these, that's, that was the one-time gain from parallelism. That's great. Now what? Everybody seems to agree that we're going to improve efficiency but with more specialized hardware. And um, I agree with that as well. But part of when we did Parallel, we spent a lot of time working on the software stack. You know, actually, most of the money went to the software stack, unlike most parallel computing projects, and but now, really, attention is focused back on the architecture, because we're going to have to change the architecture substantially if we're going to get uh, more energy uh, efficient processes. So, so we're going to ask these architects to go to research in you know, very efficient, specialized architecture. So how is research done today? This is mini rant. I, a little while ago, I went and looked at one of the ISCA proceedings. Um, this is actually 2010. Um, this is our top conference in computer architecture. So I analyzed, you know, how do people evaluate their, their architecture ideas. And I kind of broke it down. This is just me doing it, so 
caveats are I could be doing this wrong, but I went through all the papers, and about two-thirds of them, the way they were evaluating, I thought, sort of made sense for the ideas. In some cases, like, the papers had no numbers in at all, which surprised me. In reading ISCA, you usually see lots of bar graphs. A few papers had no numbers in. Um, a bunch of them were actually used some real machines. Um, some are working in some new device technology. It's very hard to build models at all, so I gave those guys a free pass. You know, it's very hard to do work in those areas. Uh, some systems, some papers were about out-of-memory system where traces and whatever it seemed to work fine, and I didn't have a problem with them. But what I was really focusing on was, you know, we're going to build more specialized architectures. That's mean new kinds of pipelines, new kinds of caches. So I looked at those papers, and about a third of them were in, in that kind of area, like inner workings of the core. And of those, I took a look at them, and you know, only two of them actually had RTL, down to the level of, do you know where all your bits are? Do you know where all the wires are? Right? Only two of the papers had that. Uh, one of them was a Stanford paper, which used Tensilica. Um, they didn't actually use the RTL, but they used the model that was built from the RTL Tensilica has, and they were happy that it was within like 30% roughly of you know, having done the RTL and back created a model, it was within 30% or so is what they claimed. Um, there's one industry uh, data center paper based on a product, so that was okay. So the other 16 were academic C simulations without real design and a lot of improvements in the kind of 20% range, right? So do you see a problem here? Um, um, you know, doing cycle counts, the cycle counts they got may have been somewhat representative, but remember, these are the papers that are focusing on pipeline and inner cache design. These are really focusing on that part of the thing, and they're doing C simulations of that, right? Um, and remember, the guys who had the RTL and built the model, they were only within 30%, right? So, you know, what's going on here? You know, um, cycle time, area energy, some of the guys, you know, the way they modeled area was, took some die photos, which are usually incorrectly labeled from ISSC proceedings or whatever, and then used that to build their area model, right? Just, you know, completely bogus. So my, you know, my take on this was, most of these papers, the evaluations were completely bogus. Actually, they were a waste of paper. Not to say the ideas were bad, the ideas could have been great. So I'm not commenting on the ideas, just on the evaluation methodology, right? So again, the ideas could have been fantastic. I don't upset my colleagues. It's just, the I know why they did this, but the evaluations are probably completely bogus. And this is a bit worrying because now we're moving to zero where it's all about energy efficiency, building more specialized cores. So this is a you know, famous painting. Um, you know, this is not a pipe. It's a picture of a pipe. And you know, those models are not really processes. They're not pipelines, right? <laughs> They're just uh, models of them. So we have to get a bit more real. Um, now, it's, it's hard. Like new computer architecture models are really hard to create. Um, cycle counts, you need a microarchitecture. Right? You actually need to have a microarchitecture um, and long runs. Um, cycle time, area, energy, lots of interactions, uh, how you design the thing, process technology design. Another thing is design space is really important. Like, why do you think your one design that you put up as a candidate is actually a good point in the design space of that family of architectures, right? Um, now, industry has a big advantage. They keep doing the same designs over and over again. So they get very good at modeling because they basically, they have all the software running on last generation chips with counters and everything. They can really tune their new models to match it well. So they, and they have real layout, they have real designs. And usually, you know, sorry Intel, but your talks are basically tweaks, you know. It's looked the same since, you know, Penny and Pro days almost. You, you know how to build that stuff, so you can keep build, you can build pretty good accurate models. But for doing far out research in academia, where you don't have that experience, how are you gonna get anything, um, you know, re reasonable as a model? You don't have that luxury. Well, basically, I, I can't see any other way. I'd love to know if there's a better way. You have to do real designs, right? You have to actually go design it for real. Um, and so my claims are why you have to do this, you can't really, create or even use an existing model correctly if you haven't built processes. Um, and, you know, undergrad hardware class projects are a good start. You know, that's how we start educating architects, but you have to keep doing it to get good, and you won't get this experience by modifying sort of seed-based models. Another claim is that um, only bad models are actually easier to build than actual designs. Good models are harder to build than real designs, right? Because you have to build lots of actual designs to build a good model, right? So. You kind of have to do real designs. Another, another thing I'll put up is this slide, a little experience I love from when I was at MIT. We taught this class with Arvind, a uh, simple hardware design class. So we gave the students a little project. One of the labs was do a two-stage risk pipeline. You know, design the RTL, you know, go fab, uh, synthesize it out. And we thought it was such a simple task. We even gave them bits of the code. We thought it was such a simple task, all the students would have basically the same answer coming out of this design lab, right? This is the results, right? So this axis is 
clock period in nanoseconds. So designs range from three nanoseconds to 12 nanoseconds, cycle time, right? That's a factor of four. Um, area, this is going from uh, 90,000 microns squared up to 150,000. So, you know, almost a bit less than a factor of two difference in um, area. This is for just a two-stage risk pipeline where we've given them a lot of the code already, right? So first thing it tells you, you know, which are the bad, which, which, what's the best design on here? Yeah. Right, so what are bad designs on here? Yeah, Any, anything that's dominated, you know, as a pretty optimal curve, right? So there's a lot of interesting design points, right? So you have this uh, pretty optimal curve. So now go back and think about people doing these architecture papers. Your student sits there and does a prototype, says this is the pipeline modeling this core. How good do you think your student is? Which of those points did they put in the bottle for the baseline or for their candidate one, right? Right, how would you know? How would you know how well they've done, right? The other thing is there is a big design space. So any simple, this is a very simple processor. Look at the big design space we got. More complicated ones, huge design, specialized architectures, you just amplify the design space by orders of magnitude, right? So getting a good design point, you have to do design space exploration. So, you know, this is what we've been working on here is how, at Berkeley is, can we make it easy to develop lots of real designs to do this design space exploration? Construct real RTL. Um, if you have the actual RTL, actually you know where all the wires are, you know where the bits are, you can get accurate cycle counts, right? And if you can actually go through the layout, in our case we're just using synthesized layout, you can get cycle time, area, and energy, right? You at least have a real world physics pushing back at you when you make a design decision, right? Um, another thing to do to get cycle counts for long running programs, we generate FPGA models automatically as well, so we can actually run things for longer. And but the big thing is, by doing real designs, you educate students to be the next generation of architects. You actually understand how to build things, right? Um, a little unfortunate now, sometimes I talk to people and, you know, it's clear they've never built something and their advisor's never built something, and maybe their grand advisor never built anything, right? So, and some very simple concepts that just don't, they don't understand why this is bad or why this is good, right? So that's unfortunate. So you want to actually train people. So to help us deal with this, we built this uh, language called Chisel. Stands for constructing hardware in a Scala embedded language. This is an embedded ESL. It's kind of like Siegis, but embedded in Scala, we built a hardware description language. And basically, hardware is just a data structure in Scala. And the real great thing about this is we use the full power of Scala, which is a nice language, has all these nice language features to write generators, but also we use it to layer higher levels of language description on top of this base level. So we can do some very powerful things that build generators. Uh, so Jonathan Makarak is the main, uh, UCB, he's the main developer of. Uh, Chisel. So what does Chisel look like? Well, if you have a design description in Chisel, Chisel compiler can then output any one of these from the same description. Uh, we can output very fast C++ code and get a cycle simulator out of there. Or we can generate FPGA emulation, uh, going through the, the standard FPGA tools to generate FPGAs. Or we can generate Verilog, we can synthesize to get real layout that we can go fabricate from chips. And we also use that layout to extract area cycle time energy numbers from designs we do. Okay, so a lot of, the, you know, isn't this too hard, like building with stuff for real, too expensive? Well, um, first thing, you have to be able to design, you just gotta be able to, if you can't design microprocessors, I don't know why you're trying to tell other people how to do that better, right? It's just, you know, I'm sorry, but you have to be able to design microprocessors, right? Um, advances in tools make this more tractable, um, especially in the synthesis tools. So we've been, uh, also we've been working on better libraries and tools, and at least in open source. I should have said, Chisel's actually out there. You can go to that website, you can download it, go to the GitHub project and get hold of it. We're putting up a lot more stuff over the summer, more cores and things so other people can download and use this. Um, and the other thing is you don't actually have to fabricate every design. The, the point is you design it to the point you almost could fabricate it. And the tools are pretty good. Once you have the layout, you can extract and get very good numbers out of it. Right? Um, um, but uh, what I've learned over the years is um, building chips is actually fun. And the main reason you build chips these days is morale. Is actually number one reason, and credibility. People really like building chips. So um, I started a long time ago building chips. This was my thesis chip. Um, it was a vector chip. Um, I was involved with the vector IRM a little here at Berkeley. Uh, I was on the vector chip. Um, detect a trend here. So MIT built scale as a vector chip. Not notice the gap between these. There's like quite a few years in between these chips. More recently, we taped out something in 28 nanometer, another vector style core experimenting with um, in 28 nanometer. We just taped out this other one, a 45 nanometer. There's another one coming out in August. Well, you might notice there's a lot more chips, right? And the same few students are doing all of these chips. Right, so how are we churning out all these chips? So one advantage is 
A lot of them are similar, but not the same. They're being used in different projects, right? Um, we've been trying to push a more agile hardware development methodology, which basically consists of going through the entire process automatically and really automating as much of that flow as possible. So like, you know, there's no such thing as an RTL freeze in our development methodology. We just will go all the way through the stack continually and keep pushing through an iterator. What you might also notice, these are all different process technologies, which is actually the biggest hurdle. So building chips, the RTL is the really easy part. That's actually trivial. The physical design is the big challenge in actually getting these things finished and working and fabable. But so it's fun to build stuff. Um, um, but you don't need to do most of the research. I think this is just, actually these, these are being fab for other purposes, like they're doing work on low voltage resiliency with weird DC-DC converters, and the other ones with photonics integrated. So the process is just kind of an afterthought that they need to run the rest of the experiment, right? But we get the fab as a result. Um, Someone comment about this, you know, is synthesizable laser design close enough? Um, for right, well, for handhelds, handhelds, SOC, that kind of space, that is how people do designs in industry, right? There is the Intel class, you know, Intel, sort of IBM, and the stalwarts keep doing this custom design, you know, five or six years of careful engineering, lots of detailed synthesis. Those glory days are kind of passing, right? Um, glory days of custom circuit design are over for many reasons. On the slide, I won't go through them. Um, but I think as an architect researcher, it's close enough, you get the insight you need from doing this level of design. And actually matches actually what you would do in industry for uh, this kinds of cores, the kinds of cores we're gonna see coming out. Anyways, so that was a mini rant on, you know, people should build stuff. It's a lot easier to build stuff than there's ever been. Um, a lot closer to industry probably than we've ever been when we do this stuff in, uh, in academia. So people should be doing that. So just wanna say a little about our uh, bigger project that we've sort of been starting off based on starting from a lot of the Parlab stack, the new project Aspire. Um, so basically starting with applications, you know, how are we gonna, what's our story on the specialized hardware? Everybody is working in this area. We're gonna leverage all the work we've been doing in Parlab on patents and the patent-based software decomposition. Um, so we start with applications, we break them down into our patents. Um, and we've been sort of pushing this idea of, you know, the way to do heterogeneous processing is have a central processor with a sort of satellite array of specialized engines. It's more a coprocessor model rather than the idea you have a sea of GPU stuff over on the other side of the chip, right? So augment, it's kind of like you have the SIMD units on a regular processor, we go even further with more kinds of engines stacked around the central core. We think there's a lot of good reasons to build it this way. We call this ESP, um, ensembles of specialized processors. The idea is this ensemble of specialized engines can execute any kind of app you throw at it with greater efficiency. So you might imagine having a you know, standard core ILP engine, and then the idea is these side core processes are actually targeted for the given patterns. So the, you know, in part of we keep saying these patterns are the things that recur. They're the common operations. So we'll build the engines to match those patterns. So that's our idea of building something that is more efficient than regular cores, but still has the coverage and flexibility and programmability to cov cover the application space. And what's nice is we already know um, how to program this because we built these specializers for each pattern, and building a specializer for a pattern to target an engine designed to execute that pattern, we think should be pretty straightforward. And we won't have to change the application code, right? Whether you have that accelerator there or not. This sort of pattern-specific accelerators is kind of what we've been uh, working on. So you're gonna generate a whole bunch of code loot together. And what's nice is we can actually take these designs and push them all the way down through either emulation or down to ASIC, and then the very really important part is doing this design space exploration, not just around the hardware, but around the whole stack as well. So in the software level, you're auto-tuning for a given architecture design point, figuring out the numbers you get there, and then iterating the whole loop. So two levels of uh, design space exploration. So this is kind of what we're exploring in this next project, how to really drive uh, down the efficiency, or drive up the efficiency of these uh, specialized engines. Okay, so summary, you know, we gotta focus on efficiency, that's 21st century architecture. Um, a huge range of possible specialized architectures. And really, you, I can't see any other way except actually having a layout to analyze them, right? So how are we gonna produce that? I told you our approach. Um, one of the good things we're trying to open source all this BSD, and I think the important thing is, have people actually stare at your RTL and say, well, your core is, you have this really dumb idea in this part of the core, why don't you do this? And you say, sure, we'll do that. We're not claiming we know how to build the best cores, but we'll put them out and host them, and have other people contribute, and hopefully we'll drive towards a commonly agreed good baseline design for a lot of these design points. Um, yeah, and I th this last thing, it'd be great if you know, people did papers that actually improved fabricatable designs. That would be really cool. Okay, that's it. Do we have questions for Kirsten? Yes, John? Yeah, more of a comment. Um, 
one of the things that I really like about Chisel, which you didn't actually bring up, was there is a, a common description of your hardware in Chisel and the scale language that allows you to push it in any of those directions. And so for the design space exploration, I can do really rapid things on the C++ side, and I know that that same design thing is going to be in RTL or FPGA. So I mean, I think that's a real powerful thing that there's not in the industry, we have a different set of tools for each level of thing, whether it's a simulator right. or whatever, and this really unifies, and I think that's very powerful. Yeah, that was, that's actually one of the driving irritations of right. previous stuff we did. So, Robert? My understanding of most of your methodology is that it builds toward exploring microarchitectures. Does it also lend itself to explore, exploring ISA? Oh, no, no, definitely. So these specialized architectures, those are completely new ISAs. It's a very rich instruction set. We complete like graph engine, new instructions to do with graphs and things like that. ISA has to do is uh, <coughs> writing codes in the new proposed instructions, seeing whether compilers can generate them. But that's where our specializers come in. So we're targeting them through the specializers. But I think you have another advantage going on here. You know, there's lots of different specializations you showed there. For example, sparse and graph. Maybe they're not different. How do you find out? Well, you've designed them both, I suppose. Right. But then you've got a program in both. Yep. And you've got to take the same problem and target both of those architectures to decide, for example, we don't need any dynamic uh, type uh, in, uh, discrimination support in the architecture. We can do it all in risk. I remember a paper like that. <laughs> right? right? So, but you have an advantage here with, with, the, with, the, with the programming technology you've got. You could write special, you could write silos that would right. go to both targets and compare them from the same source code to both of the ends without nearly as much trouble as you would have inventing new languages and recoding things in other forms right. and so on. So I think this could be pretty interesting. OK. All right. Okay. Um, Matson from Intel. And um, so Tim is going to end the session with fireworks, talking about the many core processors at Intel. He's going to have Message passing, message passing for future. And uh, uh, after this, we will get some chairs and start the panel. And um, thank you very much for staying with us for so long. And uh, it has been a very long day, but uh, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you have a lot of uh, good insights. So thank you. Okay, thank you. So this is what I really would like to talk to you about is kayaking and kayak surfing, but <clears throat> no. You that. And, yeah. <laughs> but we won't. Have to have this disclosure, though. You know, I work for Intel, but these are my views, not Intel's views necessarily. You will learn absolutely nothing about any Intel product from what I have to say. This is a team effort, but if I say anything stupid, I own it, not my teammates. And I want to emphasize it's my job to challenge dogma and to explore alternate realities. So don't for a second think that I'm telling you about any kind of future Intel product, period. All right? So this is my favorite slide. And I apologize. There's some of you here from Berkeley who've heard me give this talk many times. I, you guys can go ahead and lay your head down, take a nap. I won't be offended. Uh, <laughs> But this is a slide I pulled out of an Intel executive's deck from 2006. But I just love it, because it's talking about this great vision of many core and how we're going to have, you know, we had the single core, now we got dual core. And now in the future, we're going to have these, these lots and lots of cores with a shared cache and a local cache and how the cool this is. But notice the implicit assumption, the, just the automatic assumption that, of course, there's a cache coherent shared address space. Now, I want you to think back about the talks you heard today. We heard about heroic research to try and find races. We heard about bizarre tool chains to try and prove that, that, that you could do lock elision. We heard about this weird bulk multi-core architecture, which could do rollback if you had a memory conflict. All this complexity, this insane complexity, so that we could have a shared address space. I think. A shared address space, perhaps, is just a big mistake. The fact of the matter is that if you get expert parallel programmers, and I've been there. I know what I'm talking about here. 
you get expert parallel programmers who have been doing it for decades and ask them to explain the relaxed memory models they work on. 99% of the time, they will get it wrong. All right? So we're going to build our future on a model the experts can't understand? How smart is that? I think that's pretty stupid. Also, the only programming models that we know for a fact will scale to hundreds or thousands of cores for non-trivial, I mean non-embarrassingly parallel workloads, the only proof points we have are based on, um, are based on shared, uh, distributed memory, message passing style programming. And furthermore, I know people tell me I'm wrong. I know architects who are very, very clever tell me I'm wrong. That's fine. They have that right. But I'm the one up here speaking now. I just, <laughs> as you add the circuitry and the chip area to the power to manage that shared cache coherent state, that's not scalable. Amdahl's law is a real law. It's going to eat up some of your overhead. It's going to become expensive. So at some point, I think we're going to have to get rid of it anyway. So I want to ask the question, maybe, just maybe, we should bite the bullet and recognize that cache coherent shared address space was a stupid idea. And the sooner we get rid of it, the better. So we had a research program at Intel where we actually said, OK, let's build some chips that are arbitrarily scalable, meaning we can scale them as far as our process technology will take us, and do not have cache coherent shared address spaces. So we built two of these. We have an 80 core flop monster, also called the Polaris chip, and a 48 core chip, the single chip cloud, probably the worst named chip in history, but that's what it was called. Um, but this was created as a software research platform. So let me say a little bit about these chips, and I'm being very conscious of the time. And of course, I have to credit my collaborators, in particular Rob van der Vingart, who I work very closely with on all of these projects, but also the hardware team. You know, Jason Shriam and Saurabh have been just delightful to work with. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about this 80 core TerraScale processor. The goal of this project was, could we get a teraflop for under 100 watts? And uh, we basically did that. It was 65 nanometer process, which, is, which at the time, um, back in uh, 80, not 80, back in um, when we built this in 2006, 2007, uh, that was the leading technology. It was the 65 nanometer process technology, 8 by 10 tiles, mesosynchronous clock. Um, offline, I can go into all sorts of low level details there, but in I, the 10 minutes I have left, I can't do that. But, the interesting part to me was what the cores looked like on this chip. Now, this is not a general purpose processor. Of course not. But from a point of view of an old HPC hacker, I love this chip. It's marvelous. OK? Two floating point multiply accumulate units, a five port router, so I could do XY routing between tiles, and I could go directly into the, uh, the data memory or the instruction memory. So I could write things into the memories, whether it's instruction or data, without interrupting the core. If you want to build highly, highly scalable architectures, that's a wonderful feature. And if we went through all the little tiny itty bitty numbers here and added them all up, what you would find is that this is a perfectly balanced processor, meaning I can move the stuff from the instruction memory fast enough to drive the chip at peak speed. I can pull things out of the data memory enough to keep those floating point units fully occupied. So it's a very well-balanced chip. There's no division. There's no integer unit, because you know those are for weenies. If you're a real programmer, all you need is a floating point multiply add. Um, <laughs> the interesting thing is there's 256 96-bit instructions per core. This is not cache. It's memory. And I could hold a just stellar 512 single precision words per core. So this isn't a general purpose chip. All right, we, we know that. Um, so um, we wrote some kernels for it. I won't call them applications, but you know, we got a stencil kernel going. We got a matrix multiply going. And uh, we said it was impossible to do a 2D FFT. So of course, uh, Michael Frumkin, working with us, uh, had to do a 2D FFT just to show us how wrong we were. But we got this stencil code running at a teraflop for 97 watts. We're cool. We rock. Um, for me, this was really cool because I was involved on the first teraflop supercomputer in 1997, and ten, you know where we had 
uh, one megawatt of electricity and 1,600 square feet of, uh, of, of floor space. And 10 years later, we're doing 97 watts and 275 square millimeters. That's pretty cool in one person's career in 10 years. I think it's pretty cool. But the problem with it is, of course, it, it was a stunt. We know that. It was a stunt. You know, no, no one could do any real serious software with a chip like that. So the next one in the family, the 48-core chip, it was built as a software research vehicle. Now. There was the talk that Krista gave, we talked about Intel with its hand layout and all that stuff. That's indeed what we do with our products. But for this, we wanted to go directly synthesizable off the RTL. And there was only a few cores we had that you could directly synthesize from the RTL when we went to tape out this chip. And the one core we had to do that with was the P54C. P54C is the Pentium 3. Ancient core, we know that. But, but you know, the idea is we wanted something we'd grab off the shelf, drop it in there, x86 so people could write real software, and it's a message passing architecture. Now, here's the interesting thing about this chip. We have two cores per tile, 24 tiles. They have their regular cache architecture for the individual core. Then there's a message passing buffer which is a scratch, it's a terrible name, message passing buffer, because what it is is a scratch space. It's scratch pad memory. So to the programmer, this is what the chip looks like. I have 48 cores with an L1 and L2 and private DRAM. Then I have this message passing buffer, which is a high speed uh, on die, on chip, scratch memory space. And then I have this off chip shared DRAM, but there's absolutely no cache coherency to that off chip DRAM. So what we're trying to do with this chip is explore an alternate design where you have some shared memory. But remember, a lot of the problems with shared memory comes not from sharing the memory. It comes from the shared address space with accidental sharing, where you can accidentally stumble over each other's addresses. Here, all of that is managed at software. There is no non-scalable cache coherency protocol. This is us trying to have our cake and eat it too. So there's a little bit of shared memory, but without hopefully the bad parts. So we built this chip. And another thing interesting about this chip is we have explicit control of the power. We have voltage control at the tile, I'm sorry, frequency control at the tile level. level. You can individually uh, vary the voltage on the interconnect. And then you have these blocks of eight cores per voltage domain, so I can vary the voltage on these voltage domains, and all of that is exposed to the programmer. So we can do research on people experimenting with explicit control of the voltage and the frequency. Marvelous research platform. And in a long version of this talk, I would go through and go through research results and talk about it. Um, invite me to come back some time, and I can talk to you a whole, bit, a whole bunch about that. But in the five minutes I've left, I want to talk to you about something else. So I hear again and again, shared memory is so much easier than message passing. Shared memory is just the only way to go. And the people who say that, I submit, haven't written much, if any, message passing code and shared memory code. Or they base that conclusion on the following. They take a matrix multiply code, matrix multiply kernel, and they run it. Or they take some other trivial little toy program. All right, what I want to point out is I've done professional software development of products that use both message passing and shared address space. And you measure when did you start the project, and you end when you deliver optimized validated code. Not little toy demonstration code. I mean real applications. And what you find is with message passing, I'm plotting effort over time, you indeed have a brutal learning curve. And if you never do the optimization validation, so you're just looking at this beginning piece of the curve, then indeed, you're going to conclude that shared address-based programming is much easier. Because you can just sort of you know, add a directive here or there, or do a couple fork joins. It's real easy to sort of you know, sneak in that concurrency control. Whereas in the message passing, I have to break up my data structures, decide how they're going to be distributed. I got to do a lot of work up front. But the point is, and here's the key thing, when you look at real code that you're going to deliver and support as an application that must be optimized and validated, then you have to go through after you've done that initial uh, parallelization and optimize and validate. And I'll tell you, once you've broken up those data structures into chunks, 
because so much of optimization is managing data locality, that job's pretty much, you've done the hard part of it already. What we find in these shared address-based programming is you don't do that work up front, but by the time you get it optimized, you've done that work. You have to cache block. You have to break things up. So my, I submit, look, just do it up front. In the long run, you're better off. And you don't have race conditions. If you're disciplined in how you use the message passing, and I can tell you exactly what I mean about that, it's basically don't use wildcards. If you're disciplined in your use of message passing, you write code that's almost automatically race-free. Whereas, of course, with shared address-based programming, proving you're race-free is NP-complete, and you change the data set, and your program that your tool told you was race-free all of a sudden is full of races. So I submit that, that someday we as a community will wake up and go, I can't believe we were insane enough to ever push this shared address-based cache coherence. And we will all change to a message-passing road. Uh, and I, 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 I want to okay, so I want to emphasize two things, and then I'll be done. And I'm watching the clock; I'm going to be done exactly at 4:30. All right. You're always going to be last. A lot. I know. <laughs> That's what I get for that. Um, a lot of people criticize message passing because they say, "Well, gosh, no one wants to put all these sends and receives in their programs." Well, if you look at a serious message passing program, there aren't very many sends and receives. And I have an example project here. They're in the slides I can talk to you about. It's where they build a linear algebra library. But what they do is they break their job and they decompose into panels of matrices. And they're doing dense linear algebra, so they have domain-specific collective communications of all gathers, reduced scatters. This really, they call it send-receive. It's really exchange is a better name. The point is, that in the real application, you have collective communications that reply to a domain-specific type library. There's very, very few instances of MPI send, MPI receive. Few to almost none. And so I'm telling you, message passing, if it's done right, is usually structured well, like in the scale pack world. They have the blacks, the basic linear algebra communication subroutines. Same thing there. Experienced uh, message passing programmers do not write a lot of sends receives. They do these global, these collective communication operations. It's actually not as hard as many of you think. Give it a try. You might find you like it. And then the other thing I close with is barrelfish. I love barrelfish. All right. Why do I love barrelfish? Because they take the concept of an operating system that's split between a host and devices, and it's a message-based operating system that they give you a consistent view across both host and device. It's fundamentally based on message passing not shared address space underneath with cache coherence. And therefore, it maps onto these modern heterogeneous platforms. I love it. And I hope to spend a lot more time with it. It's 4.30. I have to finish. Thank you. So that's really nice to wake up again. We have a panel. Well, that's OK. Let's try to so, so it's good that you don't speak for Intel, because all the Intel processes are cached here. You notice how many times I said at the beginning, I don't speak for <laughs> Intel. So, so. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Tim, but I, I have to quibble with the following. I, so I've gone on the record many times saying shared memory is the world's best compiler target and the world's worst programming model. OK? OK? Don't confuse the two. Don't say, well, we have to build our architectures to pass messages because we need the handcuffs to keep us from killing ourselves with data races and, and things like that. How about this? Don't, don't use coherence for everything. Don't use shared memory for everything. Instead, write in a functional or mostly functional language. Do as little update in place as possible and do everything with messages at the programming level, or, or maybe even at higher level than that. But don't blame it on the fact that the hardware underneath is shared memory. The great thing about shared memory is that it allows load balancing, and it allows dynamic localization. And if you use it for that, it'll be your friend, and you won't kill yourself with cache coherence. If you use it the way we're using it today, I agree with you. But, but we have to stop doing that, at least. Um. Excellent point. You may very well be right, though I'm not ready to necessarily concede it. But I think where you and I do agree is I'm a software guy. I'm not a hardware guy. What I'm really talking about is yeah, the, the people writing the software should write MPI. They should write message passing. They should write a code. Yeah, that's what they should write. 
And if underneath you hardware guys who are much smarter than me, I know that, um, figure out how <laughs> that the best way to support us with a shared address space, you go for it. But I think programmers, they're just not going to get straight the, the, the shared address space. Okay, so got uh, more questions? James? So, so I think you maybe answered the examples you gave, but aren't patterns supposed to make hide a lot of the details from most programmers? So the question was, won't patterns hide most of these details from programmers? That's the ultimate dream, but let me be really clear on software development and in the patterns world, because I'm kind of one of the people pushing that really hard. When I go deeper and I talk about the whole software stack, I also stress the importance to support opportunistic refinement so that the developers on your teams can drop lower. So even though that top level domain specialist programmer probably never will go below the patterns, there will be plenty of people on the team who need to go all the way down to the lowest level. And so it's not true that when you look at the whole software development stack, the people are not going to have to pay attention to the low level details. And therefore, it is important. What is it the, what's, what's the programming model we expose to those people, the efficiency programmers? John also had a question. Oh, no, it was Adi. Yeah, so I mean, I think that the patterns are kind of like the, the driver's manual. And what we're really looking for is, is guardrails. And a message, passing pro, message, a message passing model gives you a lot of those guardrails, right? It, it stops you as a programmer doing the, the, the things that are going to really hurt you in the long run with, say, shared memory. Just here, here's the, it does that, but here's the other thing it does, is it forces you to make the hard decisions up front. And what I'm saying is, by the time you optimize a highly scalable code, you're going to make those decisions anyway. You know, you, I, I've, I've written and optimized more OpenMP code than I could ever count. And I'm telling you, by the time you're done, you have figured out how the, how the data is going to block, how the locality is. I mean, you know, same thing with pthreads code. You know, you're going to have to figure all that stuff out anyway. Kind of what I'm saying is, OK, do it up front at the design phase. When you're starting out, that's the best place to do it. In the long run, you're going to be better off. So I, I agree with that statement, but then you make the conclusion that you should be doing it in MDI. Yeah. Well, OK, fair enough, fair enough. I, my conclusion is you should do it with a programming model that ex, does not expose a shared address space. And, you're right. Suppose, suppose it was a single assignment language, Tim, OK? Suppose it was yeah. shared address space, but you couldn't overwrite anything. All you could do is collect it when it was dead. Like, so, like Sizzle. Like Sizzle. Yeah, like and you know, Sizzle was such a successful language. I mean, how many people are writing Sizzle right now? Huh, really? Interesting. You know, I was involved with Parlog. How many people are writing Parlog right now? You know, the fact of the matter is, we're not going to be able to dictate what language people are going to use. So we have to come up with a, with a collection of abstractions that work for the families of languages people actually use. Yeah, but if you look at, at languages that are emerging and are successful and so on, like Scala, for example. Scala is a very good language for a lot of reasons, but one of them is it, it has a very powerful functional subset. You don't have to write it in this imperative style if you don't want to. Right. And there are others like that. So I agree. So John from Poly has the last question. So uh, Bert brought this up before, but it seems to me that there should be a separation between shared memory and cache coherence. And right. you, you link the two. And, and I say that from the standpoint that I'm working right. on projects where I'm explicitly using message passing to pass tokens to data, but I'm leveraging the shared memory so that I don't have to copy stuff. So, so I think right. that right. you're misleading things by saying shared memory is evil but it's shared memory plus cache coherency. So right. I, I try to be careful and I do slip up, so let me be clear. What I'm attacking is a cache coherent shared address space. The most productive programming model I've ever worked in is global arrays. Now granted, that's my application domain, so it's, but, but that's a shared memory model. Right, right. So that's what I'm saying. It's yeah. Very interesting You're, you are absolutely right. Let's be clear. I'm attacking a shared address space programming model. Is good. Yeah, yeah. So I think we have to stop here and I learned something after listening to Tim that instead of having breaks, we should have him talking during the breaks. <laughs> so no one has to listen to well, me. That's, that's, that's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so now we're going to have a panel and we need to put some chairs so that we can start with the talk for the panel. So we being the panelists bring our chairs. Sure. So, yes, one. Great chair.